and I am going to, yes, and I'm going to start um, letting people in. So I'm going to hide, I'm going to mute myself, just let people in. Um, and we'll, we'll be right back. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're giving everybody a few minutes to join in. So we appreciate your patience. Just as a heads up for all of you that are joining in, this is going to be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Um, we also have available closed captioning um, at the bottom of your screen. So and you can activate that by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us and we'll give everybody a few minutes. Hello everyone and welcome to everybody that's joining us through the chat. Let me see how many people we already have in. All right, respecting everybody's time, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, my name is Solimar Salas, Vice President of Content and Innovation and Outreach at the Museum of Latin American Art. My pronouns are she, her, and I recognize that I live and work on the traditional and the sacred lands of the Tongva, Kitsch, Akshaman, and Chumash, and that many other indigenous groups who call these grounds home. I honor and extend my gratitude to all of the original people still living in this region. Thank you for joining us today, Wednesday, July 6th of 2022, as we begin a new session of GRIT, Generating Radical Inclusion and Transformation. This series explores how grit, an attribute often given to people who overcome obstacles, can serve as a tool to build agency. With a specific focus on creative expression, grit seeks to expand what it means to practice art for social change. Support for the interpretive programming at MOLA is provided by the Genesis Inspiration Foundation from Hyundai Motor America, the Miller Foundation, Dwight Stewart Youth Fund, Arts Council for Long Beach, the Robert Gumbiner Foundation and City of Long Beach. Today's conversation is facilitated and hosted by Griselda Suarez. She is a writer, artist, cook, and a teacher. She was born in unincorporated East Los Angeles and walked the Whittier Boulevard and Brooklyn Avenue in black and white saddle shoes. She grew up in a place where her thoughts did not easily find voice. Instead, she found a pen and paper. Her hometown inspires her to investigate memories of a home space that continues to be bodiless. She believes that the arts are essential in empowering others to express their thoughts. Throughout her career, she has created programming and training dedicated to facilitating transformation and creating agency for her communities. Today's guest is Dr. Mike Munoz, currently Long Beach Community College District Superintendent and President. He started in his new role at Long Beach City College on March 4th, 2021. Dr. Munoz is a nationally recognized transformational leader in higher education. He is an expert in closing racial equity gaps for students of color, creating inclusive campus cultures for LBGTQIA students, and effectively leading for transformational change. He joined the LBCC in 2018 as the Vice President for Student Services, providing executive leadership to LBCC's enrollment services, financial aid, and counseling, student health, and psychological services student life, athletics, and student equity programs for the more than 30,000 students at LBCC. 
During his tenure, the LBCC Student Support Service, Services Team in, increased enrollment of Long Beach City College, promised direct high school matriculants by more than 30% from fall 2018 to fall 2019, increased the number of Pell recipients by 27% in 2019 to 2020, expanded services in mental health and basic needs, and supported the increase in completions through the implementation of complete, completion counseling efforts. He pushed for additional technologies such as virtual queue line, chat box functions that have become increasingly used during the pandemic to assist LBCC staff to be more efficient and enhance communication between the college and students. Dr. Munoz has been instrumental in LBCC's work so far in advancing racial equity work at the college's co-chair of the president's task force on race and equity and serves as the lead administrator for the college's framework for reconciliation. He has also provided support and leadership by serving on the Long Beach College Promise Steering Committee. A product of the California Community College System, Dr. Munoz attended East Los Angeles College and Fullerton College before transferring to the University of California, Irvine, where he received his bachelor's degree in psychology and social behavior. He received his master's degree in counseling and his doctor of education with a specialization in community college leadership from California State University at Long Beach. He is a first-generation college student. While attending college, he experienced both food and housing insecurities, all while caring for his daughter as a single father. Dr. Munoz has extensive experience teaching both at the undergraduate and graduate levels in counseling and higher education. He has taught master's level courses at California State University Long Beach and USC, and doctoral level courses at California State University LA. He is currently serving as an adjunct professor of higher education at the USC Rosier School of Education, teaching a leadership course focused on the community colleges. Munoz was recognized as an outstanding faculty member in 2019 from USC's Rosier Student Organization and the 2018 Dr. Cynthia S. Johnson Award from CSU Long Beach that recognized his contributions to higher education through exceptional student mentoring. On the national stage, his leadership experience includes serving on the board of directors for the National Community Colleges Hispanic Council as a founding board member of Colegas, the California Community Colleges Latinx Professional Association, and as an appointee by Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis to serve on the state's ADT Intersegmental Implementation Committee. Remember to drop all of your Q and A's. We will have a Q and A section at the end of this session. With that incredibly thorough introduction, I welcome Griselda, and I hand over to her the baton for today's session. Again, an honor to have both of you here as well and have a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Gracias, Olimar. Gracias. Thank you for that wonderful intro. Hello, buenas noches, everyone. Como están todos? Dr. Munoz, Mike, welcome to GRIT. I'm really excited to be here. I am. Um, uh, I have such pleasure having you here tonight. Happy Pride. It's Pride Week in Long Beach. Um, and uh, hope to see many of our community out there this week. And, uh, you know, we, we, are, we are fortunate to have you um, in the GREET series. We usually and often talk to artists or cultural practitioners. And I think as an educator, right, faculty at Chicano Latino Studies at Long Beach State, I think often um, we do not give enough space to talk about how education and culture are so intertwined. It's not about the book culture, but the culture of the campus, the culture of a classroom, the culture of student activities, right? That, that definitely impacts our creative students. So I'm glad that you said yes tonight. And for any of you who have attended, who have not attended GRIT before, GRIT is a moment of storytelling. Um, we have some goals with GRIT for every session, but it really is a time to give our guests moments to give us their stories, to have a conversation. And so um, we will be taking questions towards the end of, of the evening and I will be announcing that. And I'm going to start first with the big question, Mike, of a voice. Voice is very important. And how did you 
cultivate your voice? And was anyone helping you with that throughout your, your career and life? So first of all, again, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight and be in community with all of you. I'm really excited. Um, and I love this kind of introductory question, right? Like, um, how did I culture my, cultivate my voice and, and who kind of helped me through that process? So I'm gonna kind of like take it back a little bit and, and just kind of situate myself as a young person. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you some context. I think, you know, um, I have four brothers and three sisters and I kind of was, um, I, I just kind of like an awkward little kid, to be honest with you. Um, I was a preemie in the late seventies when, you know, preemies, it was a little bit harder for preemies to survive, to be perfectly honest. I was an incubator for a while. So I was kind of always really small um, for my size and weight as a kid. And, um, but I had this really big personality. And so I think um, I used my personality in ways to compensate for what I didn't have in size, right? And so I found really early on that I could make people laugh, that you can connect with people through storytelling and through, and through just, you know, sharing. You know, I always tell my students, there's a lot of power in our personal narratives. And so for me, I think just as, an, as a young person, I just kind of had these natural, this natural instinct to talk a lot and to kind of be very, um, my mom would say I like to share more than I probably should. So I think that just naturally came to me. But I think um, also at the same time, I'll be honest, you know, as a kid, I experienced some trauma. I saw some things in my household that was not good and, you know, that had an impact on me. And so I think for me, really, in some ways, how I dealt with some of the, that childhood, um, I'll just say that childhood trauma was through kind of this, these creative avenues and aspects that allowed me to grow storytelling. And I remember getting my hands on an old in the late, you know, 80s, an old camcorder um, that, you know, someone had kind of like, I, I feel like one of my uncles gave it to my dad and nobody really used it. Nobody, and I kind of got this camcorder and I started making videos as a kid. And this is like the pre-YouTube era. So mm -hmm. I wish, I think I would have been on Ellen if I was a kid now because I did all these really creative things with videos and I would put all my stuffed animals and I would make these elaborate scenes. And, and, and so that was kind of just this creative outlet for me as a kid. And so that kind of, again, helped me start to think about the power of using my voice. Um, and I remember my family at holidays would be like, Mikey, put on one of your videos and, and everybody would watch one of my crazy videos and they would think like, this kid's a little weird, but weird in a cool way, right? Because it would make people laugh. And so that was kind of like my early experiences. The other factor that I would point out in terms of cultivating my voice is that I've always been very justice oriented in my thinking, you know, um, even far beyond kind of like my peers as a young person, like I was, I remember being in high school and, you know, helping organize walkouts um, during um, Prop 187 or when some of our classified employees were struggling to, and these are the folks that work in our, in our um, food halls and our custodians and whatnot were we're fighting for living wages. And I remember helping organizing walkouts. And so I was always very kind of this person that had influence within um, amongst my high school peers. And I had this justice oriented lens. And so I think combining, you know, my justice oriented lens with kind of those early experiences of storytelling and tapping into my creative side. When I married both of those, I think that's when I saw kind of the impact I was able to have as a person, right, on, the com on my community. And so from there, you know, I think I started being mentored. You know, once I got into college, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, when I transferred to UC Irvine, there was this um, associate vice chancellor named Dr. Juan Francisco Lara. And he would give these speeches in front of thousands of students. And he was so charismatic. And, and he had the story that he would talk about the kukui and, you know, and how we always have a, we have a kukui that sometimes is with us and we have to, you know, get rid of the kukui, and he would do these very dramatic kind of like speeches, and everybody would have to like remove the kukui off their back, and you know, he would do these things, and I remember always thinking like, oh, I want to be like Dr. Lana, like he's just so effective at connecting with people, and whether it's a thousand people, or just sit, standing there one-on-one -on -one with you, looking at you in your eye, like you always felt connected to him in spaces, and so I remember I really admired that, and I think from there, you know, um, I started cultivating my voice and thinking of myself as a leader, because one of the things that I would say is, um, and if you're not familiar with this concept of called everyday leadership, oftentimes we think of leadership as something you aspire for, or you have to wait for, right? Like, oh, you know, 
if you say who's a leader, you think of Obama, or you think of you know Cesar Chavez or Dolores Huerta, or you start thinking these names, these icons, and so you're like, well, I can't call myself a leader because I'm not there. And the reality is, you know, the concept of everyday leadership is that you can make an impact at any time in any role that you're in, and you can make a fundamental difference in other people's lives. And so once I kind of embraced that idea of everyday leadership, I was like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm onto something here. I'm going to, you know, look at like the Dr. Lattas of the world, the Dr. Sarah Lundquist of the world that, you know, I really admire. And then I started kind of emulating them in some ways. Um, and that helped me build my voice. And then I would say the third thing that helped me cultivate my voice was seeing the impact it had on others when I was vulnerable and when I would share my own personal narrative with folks. Um, I think sometimes there's shame and stigma that comes with, you know, our past. You know, I was, you know, dealing with housing insecurities and food insecurities. I was a teenage single father. I'm gay. You know, I was, so I had a lot of, um, I experienced, you know, abuse as a kid. And so, like, I think I had a lot of stigma and trauma and that sometimes I felt like I didn't necessarily want to put out there. But when I did, it was very healing for me, but I also felt like it allowed others to feel like they could be safe and vulnerable too. And so I really loved the idea of, like I said, putting out, like reclaiming my power in our personal narratives, because not only was it healing for myself, but like I mentioned, it also allowed others the space to kind of allow themselves to be vulnerable and tap into their own personal stories. Well, it, it sounds like, um, first of all, I think we have some similar familiar roots. Went to ELAC. Mm-hmm. I grew up in East LA as well. We, we probably marched at those same Prop 187 marches, right? And you're mentioning these, these, these spaces, these events that um, are with us till this day, right? And so experiences like those, as well as traumatic experiences stay with you. And it's about how you use that energy that has been inside of you and and how you use it outwardly to impact others. And I think, I mean, it sounds like through your education courses, you teach educational leadership now, I'm sure that informs a lot of your curriculum or discussion. Um, Yes, definitely. Because I think like, like you said, there's different lenses you can bring into the classroom. And for me, I think, these experiences have allowed me to help facilitate conversations that you don't that don't necessarily come out of the textbook. You know, when we're thinking about what does it mean in leadership to be empathic, right? What does it mean to really um, take the time to understand someone's experience, right? To to empathize with them. And so some of those that doesn't always naturally come out of the curriculum. You have to be intentional about creating those spaces. Yes, intentionality is is important, and. I also wonder, you know, growing up where we grew up, growing up with these experiences, behind me tonight in our my virtual background is a mural that we at the Arts Council helped um, install at Washington Middle School. And I often think about all the murals that we grew up with and how they impacted our lives. Um, maybe they help cultivate the social justice mind or you know, what do you think about, about how art or culture impacted your framework, your social justice framework? I, I think you hit it right on the head for me. It, it cultivated, like some of the murals I saw, because um, let's be real, we didn't see ourselves in textbooks. We didn't see ourselves the curriculum. Um, and so some of the few rare moments that I got glimpses of someone that looked like me or was connected to my heritage or my ancestry was through murales. And so um, it was incredibly affirming. But then, like you said, like if you look at it deeper than just beyond like the appreciation from art and you, and you start to think more deeply about the representation of what is being depicted in that mural. Like, I think for me, you know, I, seeing Cesar Chavez, right? On, um, I remember going to a college tour and um, at UC Irvine and seeing Seth Chavez on a on mural on campus and depicting some of the struggles of the Chicano civil rights movement, like that was very impactful 
for me as a young person, because one, it, it made me believe that there was a space for me at that institution, whereas before I didn't feel that was an institution for me. Um, and then second, like you said, it made me think about the role of like these justice movements and what is my place in these movements to continue them. Because, you know, we sometimes look at these murals and we think of them in the terms of like, it's historical, right? It's capturing this historical moment in time, but like, we're still living this right now today. I mean, we've seen the recent Supreme Court case rulings, right? Like we're living this, in, this is in vivo. This isn't, you know, looking at something from 30, 40 years ago, we're in vivo right now living through this. And so I think for me, it would really help me begin to activate um, a sense of like, okay, you have duty now. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't just for me, like, oh, look at that, that mural and I feel connected to it. And yes, it was validating, but it's like, okay, like, well, what is your place? What is your role? What is your duty to continue to advance this work that, you know, and, and like I said, I, I look at this mural behind you, right? And part of me, I wants to get emotional. Like I'm holding back a little lump in my throat right now because it's also impactful, right? Like it's not just about the, um, you know, the, the, the socio contextual piece, but it's like, you know, these are human beings. I see children I, I, and then I start to tap into like what people um, are going through right now in this moment with, you know, human rights for immigrants. It's, it's, it's just, it, it's very triggering for me to just even look at this photo, but in a good way. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's a, uh... It is now uh, four years old, five years old, and the issue is still current, right? This was a fight that the artist, um, you know, when, when uh, Trump, the Trump administration was building walls and uh, the artist wanted to, to depict um, something for the community in the Washington community. It's called Love Beyond Borders. And, Many times um, an adult may see it and feel, oh, that's cool, oh, that's pretty, right? But for a middle school child to walk through that mm -hmm. every single day, walk by it every single day, it reads to the mind like a textbook. That textbook in their classroom may not be talking about this issue, but when they're walking, the mural speaks to them every single day. Right? I love that. It's, right, one of the reasons why I, um, fell in love with murales, fell in love with murals and started practicing that art form in high school in East LA and, and wanted to learn more about it. Uh, and, you know, it, it was a, a struggle for me to, to tap into um, how to learn about them, right? I, I went to college and yes, I studied art, but it was um, Chicano muralismo was not a course you would find easily. <laughs> on the list, right? Like, oh, let me take this class. Um, it took a lot of support and, and advice, advising and, and mentorship from the Chicano Latino Student Services um, and advocacy on their part to hire artists to come teach at my college. Um, Paul Teo became an instructor at my college who's connected to all of the East LA neural movement. Um, and that's how I started getting in there. And I say this story because as a educational leader, as president, superintendent Munoz, um, I'm sure these kinds of situations and, and ideas form in your mind. I mean, how, how, do, how does Long Beach City College right, um, impact us creative students? What, what kind of role do you have in that? Do you wanna share a little bit? Sure. So um, I really like how you frame this. I think it, it is a call to action for me. You know, we have a role and we need to be declared that we have a role in this space. Um, so I'm going to share some things that are probably not the most positive thing to share, but I, I believe it's important that a healthy organization, you know, can own the areas that they have opportunities to improve and grow in. So we recently did a racial student climate survey, survey on our campus where we work with USC's Race and Equity Center. And so, and if, if there's different um, metrics that they're looking at in the student survey, and one of the areas was this concept of, um, you know, affirming students, right, that they feel, you know, um, this, this concept of affirmation and mattering. And so when we look at affirmation and mattering on campus, we think about it, like you said, just in the curriculum, usually traditionally, or we think about it maybe in 
the, um, the, the books we're reading or the assignments we're giving, or even in reflecting the diversity of the folks that are teaching our courses, right? But we don't always think about it as walls. We don't always think about it as outdoor space. And so one of the questions that they measured was, um, you know, do students feel racially validated in our buildings and in our spaces? And we found out that of all the different kind of metrics they were looking at, some of our lowest ratings was our buildings. Um, and you know, it's, it's very counterintuitive because if you look at Long Beach City College and you look at what we put out in our publications, you know, we're always promoting these beautiful state-of-the-art facilities and they're gorgeous, don't get me wrong. And, and you, yeah. need, you need gorgeous facilities. You need, you know, the, the proper technology so faculty can teach in a state-of-the-art kind of way and cutting edge ways. But what it was telling us is that they were cold. They weren't communicating a sense of belonging for our students. And so we've actually initiated a campus arts committee that's working through and we're going to be, and we're funding it. And we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're allocating $50,000 a year that will support um, campus art projects such as murales, such as art sculptures. Um, but in a way that's declarative and intentional that it's going to be in a way that is affirming of our students' identities. So not just in the abstract art world, because I mean, not to say that that doesn't matter or doesn't create opportunities for discussion, but really we're looking at a focus on culturally um, affirming um, campus art. And so um, that's where we're headed. And I think that's one role. So, you know, of course, like I mentioned, you know, the curriculum matters, the assignments matter, what's in the canon matters. But I also think to your point about what you described that experience with them, the murales and what that meant for you um, and what it meant for me, even when I walked on a college campus, you know, we're moving in that direction and, and now it's, it's all very intentional. Whereas before I think, I don't think anybody was doing anything, you know, intentionally to be exclusionary in the way, you know, we set up our buildings, but it was a blind spot for us as an institution. And I think through that data that we collected, we realized, hey, there's a really great opportunity here around campus art that will allow us to kind of change, hopefully the way students feel and connect with our spaces on campus. Hmm. What are some other, thank you for sharing that, by the way. I think um, it, it is really um, great to hear an educational leader uh, speak truth to the data, right? Okay, so you always have data, wonderful. But then the action behind the data is important to share as well, right? This is what we're doing here. We're saying our intention. Um, what are some other initiatives that Long Beach City College working on right now because I know we can talk hyper local sure. right like this is what we're doing at Long Beach City College but I think you you have a wonderful vision about doing this at Long Beach City College will then probably impact the county the state right it's going to impact a lot of people so share some more about your initiatives sure so I think another way that we are engaging the arts is um, over the last few years we have really expanded our cultural heritage um, programming. We've also we've also created a social justice and intercultural center, as well as um, we have been really focused on systems impacted students, such as justice scholars, which are students who may have been engaged with you know engaged with our incarceration, our justice system, um, former foster youth, um, et cetera. And so I think one of the things that we see is that the arts is um, healing. The arts is inspiring. The arts is also a way of creating a sense of belonging for students. And so we are being thoughtful about making sure that kind of in this work, that there is a space, right, for the arts. So when we're looking at the programming that we've been developing, you know, we've been bringing in performers. Um, so, you know, for API the Heritage Month, for Asian Pacific Islander and Desi Heritage Month, we brought in this world famous pianist that kind of came in and kind of, so again, to, to bring in kind of that, that cultural um, nuance around music and performance, um, artistry, dance. Um, so if you think of all the elements, right? We've been very inclusive of that. And so that's been something that I, we've seen on poetry, spoken word. Um, and, and why I really think that's been very important is that I think as we, have been focusing on inclusion, 
because you know I think diversity gets thrown around a lot. And yes, I think everybody will agree that Long Beach City College, and for the most part, the city of Long Beach is a very diverse mm -hmm. institution, diverse city. Diversity doesn't necessarily equal inclusion, right? And 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 even beyond inclusive, it's just empowerment, right? And so I think here we're stri we're striving for more than just diversity. And so I think we've been very intentional, and the arts have been key in that respects. Um, and I think what I've seen is when you talk to students, I'll give you a case in point. Um, this was pre-pandemic. It was like right before the pandemic. So this was um, 2019 Latinx Heritage Month mm -hmm. or Latinx Heritage Month. Yeah. It was at the Pacific Coast campus and we had some Aztec dancers. We had some art going on. And you just saw students come to live. You know, people always, time, oftentimes people don't realize, you know, Long Beach City College, we're, six, we're almost 60%. Chicano, Latino, Latinx, Latina. So it's it's very, you know, but sometimes I don't think people realize that percentage. And so I was walking on the campus and I met this young man. He was like really just like lit, lit up. And I was talking to him and I said, Oh, are you enjoying this event? He just participated in a in a cultural dance. And he said, you know, this is the first time in all my years of schooling that I've ever felt like that my culture has been celebrated. And I'm thinking this guy's someone in his 20s, went through all these years of schooling, and he's never really felt that in his life. This was the first time. That was a really powerful statement. And I don't know if he would have connected with that event if we had not had that intentionality and infused, you know, all those elements of art and culture and dance into the programming. Because it kind of, I think, you know, he looked, I'll be honest with you, he looked like kind of like this tough dude. You know, and then all of a sudden he kind of let his guard down and he was out there, you know, dancing um, in a, you know, kind of this culturally affirming space. So um, mm. I think that was really, that was a aha moment for me as a leader. I was like, okay, we need to continue down this path and being intentional in the way that we're programming. Um, I will also like really want to highlight, you know, I'm very proud of our college in the sense that we really, I, I, I love that we put the city and city college you know there's this focus you know we open up our doors so we have a beautiful auditorium you know we have an amazing theaters program we have an amazing dance program and so and it's accessible i think that's what i love about it is we make um the arts and these cultural programs accessible to our community and so um th that's something else i'm also proud of yeah oh absolutely i mean your the long beach city college dance uh troop um, has won national recognition and has performed at our state of the arts event. Um, I saw your graduation ceremony. Congratulations. You got through your graduation season um, and you had your vocal um, uh, group there has also mm -hmm. performed at some of our events and is award winning. Um, you have very strong faculty. Um, a couple of your faculty have been our professional artist fellows of the year for for the city of Long Beach, um, not because they're one, not only because they're wonderful instructors, but they're also wonderful artists. Um, so yes, you definitely have the accolades in in the arts. Um, your community jazz orchestra. I mean, it go, you could you have a list. You definitely have a list. You have a wonderful new auditorium, um, and so many uh, artists I know have done the media program there. Um, you have great media training, um, news and communications. So you have a campus that, that, that has the resources and the faculty to give these students experiences, yeah. right? You and I talked about those experiences we had as young people. They're still with us. You know, that young man you talked about, he, maybe he will incorporate cultural, um, you know, nourishment and acceptance in his future role because of that one experience. It's just, I love it's, that. it's important, it's important. It's obvious that you and I don't take that for granted, but you know, we have learned at the Arts Council in our experience with local schools that some educational institutions do take it for granted, right? They don't have these touch points for their students. Um, on the last week, of school at one of our Long Beach Unified schools this year, we had a art, art tour field trip for third graders. And it was their first field trip ever, wow. right? And, and so we know that, that um, those experiences are extremely important. 
extremely important for the educational experience. Um, so I mentioned, you mentioned, I mentioned a lot of your departments. Um, do you have um, curriculum certificates, programs for um, artists or cultural workers? Um, is there a space for them if anyone here hasn't gone to or is interested in education and getting a certificate? Is there a space for them at Long Beach City College? There is a space. And so one of the things I would encourage anyone who's listening that might be thinking, you know, I want to explore this pathway. Um, I would encourage you to visit lbcc.edu. And on the landing page, there's actually a, an icon that says explore programs. Mm -hmm. And if you then click on that, there's an opportunity that leads you to arts, language, and communication, and you can get a better sense of our art programs. And, and what I love is, you know, we have art, you know, in terms of visual art, but we also have art history. And sometimes folks don't recognize the relationship between the two. There's dance, there's digital media arts. That's another form of art that um, I think there's an opportunity as well. Lots of opportunities, emerging opportunities in. Um, there's creative writing yes. that I consider as part of the arts. Um, and some other areas too that are connected to the arts, such as fashion design, um, jewelry, yes. um, film and film studies. Um, and then I would even argue, um, obviously we have acting and theater studies, but um, spatial design is an opportunity as well. So, you know, I just think that, um, and then also I would even say radio and television because I think there's a creative artistic component to that as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would encourage folks to, to visit that. And what I love about what Long Beach City College can do for you is from my perspective is, you know, it prepares you for the lattice. So if you wanna kind of start off with, you know, these kind of entry level courses that give you exposure, we have that for you if you wanna, follow the full associate degree for transfer and then transfer on and eventually even maybe get a bachelor's and a master's degree, we have that pathway for you as well. So I think there's the opportunity to either think more in terms of, like you said, a cultural worker and kind of just develop um, skills and, and some of those kind of workplace um, um, behaviors that will help you be successful. We can support you in that resource, but also the full um, educational lattice and continuum as well for transfer. And are there um, advisors, counselors? I know, for example, for spatial design, right? Let's just talk mm -hmm. about that one. Um, there's unions. I mean, we, we're we're in the LA creative yep. economy. There's theaters. There's movie sets. Are there? Do you have advisors to help with like an apprentice track? Yes. So um, we do have a work um, a workforce development unit, and so there's opportunities. For that and it's interesting um, i don't want to like you know let the cat out of the bag which i try not to use animal references because i don't want to objectify animals in the way so i'm gonna have to come up with better language but you know um i don't want to you know be too open but we are in the process of, of partnering or developing a new partnership with iatsi which is the group that kind of like you mentioned it does some of the the um stage and kind of pieces of performances at concerts and things like that and so there are so that so again there's those opportunities with partnering with organizations like an IATSE that will give you some of that apprenticeship experience or like I said the more traditional experience of, of the degree and transfer pathway so I feel like you know we would connect you with a counselor and then also with our career center to really kind of I always believe it's about um, nurturing students aspirations and kind of meeting them where they're at so, you know, some students are going to come in and be more career oriented in their thinking. And so folks are still going to be like, you know, and I want to look at, you know, that bachelor's or master's degree program. So it's, it's going to be being able to meet both students' needs. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I want to take a moment and thank you. Um, I know that um, Ruben Amador, uh, one of your faculty, um, supervises the interns for your library science program. And I know the Arts Council and MOLA um, and other you know, local organizations have had wonderful experiences with our librarian, library science interns, um, because we have an archive, right? All arts and cultural institutions have archives of some sort, <laughs> and um, they have helped with our uh, public art map archive, and in, in essence, help us with the city, and the, the city have its arts archive. And so, you know, that three-unit course 
is really impacting the um, conversation of what is public space in Long Beach and who's that space? Who does that space belong to? It belongs to the people, right? And so they're learning that within their internship class. Um, and that's how I see um, the arts as a engagement tool, right? If you're a creative, if you like storytelling, cultural expression, cultural work, it, you can make it part of civic engagement instantly by involving involving people in your community in, in this art form or whatever expression that might be. So thank you for that program. Thank you. I'd love to hear you know, how successful it is, and especially when I'm hearing our students are being placed out in these amazing organizations like MOLA mm -hmm. and like the Arts Council. I mean, it just shows it's a testament of the work of the faculty and, and the students. Yes, absolutely. Um, I see some questions popping up for us. And so I wanna uh, get to some of them. Um, oh, this is this is great. So so working with, our, you know, arts is about working with your hands. <laughs> and so this question um, is actually related to gardening, urban farm spaces. Are there any plans for Long Beach City College to work with local urban farms or farming spaces? Or do you have a current program that is that works with um, urban gardening? So that's a really excellent question. Um, so at the moment, I don't believe we have a program. At the same time, I think that there's an opportunity and probably some capacity to meet that need. So for example, the two things that jump out to my mind are we have the horticulture program at the Pacific Coast Campus, as well as the culinary program at the Liberal Arts Campus. And I could see there being an opportunity to work with a community-based organization where we can think about um, pulling in, you know, both those programs and tying them into some urban farming opportunities. Um, so, and, and I'm, and this isn't an excuse because I don't believe in excuses, but I do think we have to acknowledge certain facts that, you know, I think COVID has really slowed down some of this work because of, um, you know, the, the our attention as the institution has been going in other directions, right? And so now that I don't like to use the word return to normal because I don't think things are normal and I we're all still working through everything we've been through. Um, I think we are in a better place now to, to begin those conversations again, because I feel like some of those conversations were placed on hold because of everything we were dealing with. So I do anticipate that within the next probably 12 to 18 months, you would see some progress made in that front, because I know that there is interest on campus. Just we got it. We got to now prioritize it now that things are opening back up. But I do think there's some natural connection with our culinary program, because I don't know if you know that our culinary program actually grows all our own herbs. And they have their, so all the herbs that are used um, in our bistro are grown. I shouldn't say all, because maybe they might get some that are, but most <laughs> are used um, from our herb garden. Oh, great. And we have a horticultural program as well. Yes, and they have a great sale. You have a great annual uh, sale, your horticulture department. Um, so if you haven't been to the horticultural sale, definitely uh, go and check them out. Um, we have a question from Elaine Bernal, um, fabulous colleague at Long Beach State, um, and also a board member at the Arts Council. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, she would like to know, from your perspective, what do you see as an affir affirming space for BIPOC, BIPOC, queer, and trans students? What does that look like to you? So I think for me, when I think about that question, I think about it on a couple levels. I think one is, I don't, you know, I think we made an effort obviously to create this social justice and intercultural center as a space for, and with, you know, to be declarative and intentional about some of this work. At the same time, students should have to go to a center to feel affirmed and valued. Mm -hmm. And so I think the bigger question is, you know, what are we doing campus wide? Um, and so, and starting there. And so I think I talked a little bit about this idea of in creating a, a, a college um, public arts committee, right? Where some of, so we're thinking about the physical building. We're also thinking about um, our programming, right? So I talked about the cultural heritage and, and, when I say cultural heritage, we include the LGBTQ plus community as one of our affinity groups that we're focusing on in terms of supporting within with a certain level of intentionality. 
And so, um, you know, for example, and, and I know some of these things are symbolic and I, and I, I always like to caution by saying, you know, you have to be careful that you're not engaging just in performative types of efforts and work, that you're also looking at policies and procedures and systems. Um, so I think we, we our go-to is, you know, we raise the pride flag for Harvey Milk and, you know, we read land acknowledgements at every board meeting and we, you know, it, it's, it's easy to, to, to kind of default to those spaces. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be flip or minimize. I think it is very powerful, especially for me as a career man to walk out of the parking structure and see the pride flag flying. You know, that, that's powerful for me. But it's also, you know, there's more than just raising pride flags or, or like as I, as I mentioned. Um, so you have to also examine your policies and procedures. So I think one is, you know, how do we, you know, what story are we telling with our buildings and our um, spaces? And then the other piece is, what are our policies and procedures telling? So for example, another thing that we're doing to create inclusive spaces is we implemented our preferred name process on campus for, um, and not that that is only exclusively for our transgender students um, or, or gender non-binary um, non students. But I think that um, it, it's, it was intended to and created to really support them. Mm -hmm. And so, so thinking, like I said, policies and procedures. And then I also think um, the other thing that we've done that's new, and it's not you know, revolutionary in any way, but it's, again, a step forward is we've, been, we've created employee resource groups and not just employee resource groups. So this was one of the first things I did when I became interim president is we've identified, um, we're right now currently have five employee resource groups. So one that supports the Latinx community, our Black African-American community, our Asian Pacific Islander Desi community, our LGBTQ plus community, as well as um, um, employees who, um, employees who experience disabilities. And so we are being very mindful about what does it look like to be intentional and, and, and engaging them in our shared governance process as well. When, um, so it's not just the, not to take away from the academic and classified senates, those are important in our unions. Um, I don't believe in that these conversations are subtractive. I always tell folks these are, add, this is additive. So by creating space for, you know, our employee resource groups, you're not subtracting from your influence or your, it's, this is an additive conversation, not a subtractive conversation. And so I believe like those are some of the things that we're doing to create you know, inclusivity. Um, we're participating on, and just to show you like how, what, what this means for me, you know, Pride's this weekend. And so we're participating in the Pride Parade and we sent an invitation to the higher campus. We've had over 300 folks register that wanna walk in the Long Beach City College float come in the parade. And so um, we, we designed our logo in the pride colors. And so we created shirts with our Long Beach City College school logo in pride colors. And so everyone's gonna get a t-shirt and we're gonna wear our shirts on Sunday at the parade. And so, you know, I, um, again, like I said, it's, it's holistic, right? It's some of those things that we might think about are more kind of considered performative that I think are important for culture and climate, but then also going a little deeper with, like I said, your policies and your procedures. Um, and then lastly, I would say it's, you know, supporting our employees. Because I, I, I don't do, um, you know, I don't want to say, you know, oftentimes we talk about students and it's, again, it's important to focus on students, but also how are we supporting the employees? Yes. Um, and are they feeling, you know, seen and validated through their identities here on campus? Mm -hmm. Can they show up as their whole self? Yes. And thank you for saying and acknowledging shared governance. Right. And because that's inclusionary, right? Mm -hmm. Shared governance is inclusionary. And um, oftentimes when when I talk about DEI um, and organizations go through the process or a committee goes through the process, inclusion is also shared decision making or discussion, even like what does it mean to make a decision together, even if the organization isn't quite ready yet to take that. We have to have the conversation about shared decision making and, and shared governance. So I appreciate you you mentioning that. Um, I'm going to see if we have any questions, and um, I'm also going to have some fun questions for you. I didn't put them in the list because I wanted to ask. 
Um, so uh, we also consume, right? We, we listen, consume art and culture. Um, what are you watching right now or listening to or reading? What are you, what are you doing in that, in that realm? So I'll start with watching. And I have to be very honest. It's kind of like my guilty pleasure. Okay. I don't get to a lot, watch a lot of TV. And so I've been, you know, the school year's ended. It slowed down a little bit. I went on vacation for a week. So I've been doing a lot of Netflix, like, mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to binge, binging, right? So right now I'm like obsessed and I just finished, it kind of made me sad. Um, I just finished the uh, three seasons of Umbrella Academy. Absolutely love Loved, loved the show. I have not watched the new season. Yes, it's the new season is great. Okay. Um, so I don't want to spoil anything, so I won't. But, it, you know, I, I love the going back to, like, the diversity and inclusion of the actors. I love, um, you know, how they um, kind of dealt with Elliot Page's transition. She had, he, excuse me, had a very public transition. It's true. Um, and so that was a really, I think, validating for me to see how that was um, address and integrate it into the show in a, I think in a validating way for him. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I just, I'm really a big fan of it on many levels. And so that's kind of what I've been binging. Um, reading, I actually, um, there's a book I like to reread and I, and I use the month of June and I know it's July, but I just kind of finished it. Um, every June, I reread The Four Agreements and The Mastery of Love and um, The Voice of Knowledge. And so these are three books by Don Miguel Ruiz, mm -hmm. who is an author and kind of a, a Pulteca wisdom. It's from a, a lineage of um, kind of um, Granderas, I guess is a way to kind of frame it. And so that's been kind of my go-to in terms of centering myself. So I actually reread these books every June at the end of a school year. And I do extensive journaling and so that has been kind of what I've been really focused on this last month is kind of recentering myself um, in my principles of the four agreements and kind of, you know, this kind of full intake of my last year. You know, I, I think it's funny because in education, you know, a lot of people do like, they live their lives on the Gregorian calendar. So they're like January 1st, new year, new me. And it's like, I don't care about January 1st. That's like my new year. I'm like, new year, new me. Commencement's over, new school year. Yes, so it's yeah. like, I use like, June and July as like my rebirth, recycle, renewal process, Ooh. where others, I think, think January 1st. And so nice. I'm on that journey right now. Oh, that's great. That's a good one. And journaling is an art form. It's a form of writing. It's a form, you know, of expression. And so many journals go into archives, right? That's, it's a way we, we go back. That's great. Um, you know, we, uh, we use the four agreements at the Arts Council uh, we have a tradition at in the end of our staff meetings to do affirmations. And I have a different decks about, one of them is called Affirmators. It's a really fun deck. They have several different kinds, but one of the decks is the four agreements. I also use that. I love that. So it's funny. I actually have a deck of Affirmators as well with a unicorn yeah. on it. Yes. Yeah. So I have one. And then I also have the deck for the four agreements. So yes. it's funny. I have both of those. And oh, I go wow. usually every day and I pull one. Yes, we do that at, at our staff meetings and we have all the affirmators and gratitude cards and all these wonderful cards, less anxiety cards. Um, uh, okay, so you told me what you're reading, what you're watching. Oh, what I'm um, listening what to. Listening, yes. So I'm just like a hodgepodge. I'll be honest with you. I have been all about like my playlist that I made. And so like, I'm like one minute I'm listening to J-Lo or Beyonce and the next minute I'm listening to Saya Cruz and then I'm jumping to Tina Marie and then I'm ho jumping mm -hmm. over to, you know, um, um, Stevie Nicks and then I'm jumping to, so I'm like, I'm kind of like all over the place. So I don't really, I don't listen to radio anymore. I don't connect with um, commercial music that's out right now. So I'm just kind of listening to all my old jams and whatever pops up on my playlist, that's what I'm listening to. Um, but like my go-to, like when I want to feel good. Um, I kind of like, I'm kind of feeling Dua Lipa right now. Like I think she kind of like, oh. she's got a couple of good little jams. And I kind of like, if I want to get my heart rate up a little bit, <laughs> put on a little Dua Lipa. And... Nice. Do you have a, do you have a pride list? 
I do. I do have a pride playlist. Um, and it's a, it's a fun one. It's, it's the kind of music that just makes me want to dance. So all my favorite dance songs, um, I'm not shy. I'll duck walk. I'll do all of it. So <laughs> nice. I, I, you put on, I even got my, you know, RuPaul, some RuPaul on my pride list as well. You put that on there and I'm great. Excited. Great. Awesome. Well, um, I, I'm excited to see you at Pride at our, all our Pride events. I'm sure we'll see each other. Um, Arts Council will also be in the parade this year. And uh, come see us, come join us, um, let us know. And um, Dr. Munoz, Mike, it was such a pleasure to have you with us tonight and to hear your perspective as an educational leader about how important arts and culture are or have been in your life and are in the lives of your of your students at Long Beach City College. Um, you have amazing students, you have amazing faculty, it's a great institution. Um, we look forward to continuing to work together. Um, I'm gonna invite Solimar to, to join us here on screen and see if she has any um, additional questions or comments. Hi, Solimar. Hi, um, again, thank you both. It was just such an enlightening conversation and inspiring as well. Um, like I shared previously, MOLA has been honored to have a cohort of library technician students since um, September of 2020. So right in the middle of COVID, we were able to welcome students that were still doing their coursework, that were still working in a safe environment here. But you can you still saw how dedicated and how committed they were. And I think that's a tribute to the college as well as to the students that you recruit and are part of the system. So congratulations to you and to your entire faculty and the students, because it's just inspiring to see like what Long Beach is offering them and, and they to their community instead. So just, just putting that out there, completely agreeing with Griselda's comments about the whole program, big fan. Um, and I'm going to let I Dr. Think, Williams and Ruben know because they really deserve the credit. So I'm going to make sure I pass that along. No, it, it's again, it's it's definitely um, you you can see the difference and you can see the commitment. And I think when we talk to our cohorts, when we talk to the students, um, creating those connections, creating those that that big network of professionals, giving them the experience, um, and also making sure that there is arrangements made to accommodate for a very busy lifestyle and a very complex situation that all of them kind of go through. Um, I think it speaks very highly of Long Beach City College of making those adjustments. So again, I can't, I can't keep saying good things about that. So, um, and I think it's, it's also really, really inspiring for Mola to see um, the comfort and, and, the, and the approachability that you have as an individual in such an important um, position. The fact that you're, that you're very much in touch with the different levels of what, of what Long Beach City College can give back. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's definitely, it's been amazing to see and, and to enjoy this conversation. Um, yes, and thank you for not giving spoilers about Umbrella Academy. It's on my to be list. <laughs> it's on my to be list. Yes, um, you know we do have we uh, someone just asked a question, and I want to honor that question. Um, Karen or Karen Fabrigas. Um, this is her question. Um, as a student that came away from that came from a faraway country and have has had culture shock. What advice can you give to me? After 15 years, I'm going back to school. What advice can you give me being, and since, you know, it's a little scary. Sure. So first of all, I'm really happy to hear that you want to come back to school. And so first, I want you to know there's a place for you at Long Beach City College. And I think that's important. Um, and I think first it's okay to be, um, when you think about like advice, the first is I wanna start with just kind of telling you it's okay to be a little nervous and question like, you know, um, I think those are very normal human experiences, right? Like, especially um, for any student that's, you know, returning to college after many years. So be kind to yourself, um, I think is the first and be proud of yourself that you're willing to put yourself out into this space. I think the second is, I always tell students is build community. 
mm-hmm. and find ways to build community because we don't walk these journeys alone. You know, I, you know, we love to talk about American exceptionalism and all these things. And, but the reality is when you talk to most students and you ask them like, what made the difference for you getting through college? You know what I find most of the time students respond, it's a person or a group of people. So really, you know, it just tells me that the power of, a, of building a community of support is really important on your educational journey. And so I think when you come to Long Beach City College, I'm gonna, um, if you can, and I think I can maybe do it here. I'm gonna see if it gives me the option. I'm gonna put my personal email in the, well, I, I don't see a chat. So um, I don't know how to, to, well, I do see a chat now. So I'm gonna put my personal email in the chat, email me, and I will make sure you get connected with someone on campus that's gonna you know, really take the time to answer all your questions, connect you with the right program services and resources, get, make sure you get the right set of classes you need. Um, and then, like I said, help you build that community of support because um, that's really important. And then lastly, um, just be yourself. You know, I think oftentimes we feel like we step into these academic spaces and we have to hide parts of ourselves. Yes. I don't want you to feel like you have to do that. Be yourself, embrace your identities, embrace your culture, your history, um, and, and you know, channel our ancestors when we're in this space. You know, I, I want you to know that you don't have to hide parts of you. Embrace all of you in these spaces. Oh, well, what wonderful advice. That's awesome. Oh, I don't know if you can see her comment there, uh, Mike. That's great. Wonderful. Oh, great. Uh, what a lovely uh, note to, to end our, our grit session. Um, be yourself, celebrate yourself, celebrate your culture, feel the human experience. All of those are just, that's just wonderful. That's great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Solimar, send it back to you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for sharing this space with us tonight. Our guest speaker, Dr. Munoz, an honor. Um, Grisela, as always, such a pleasure to have you um, be part of this El Espiritu, this of this great series. Um, definitely um, always a pleasure to find out new things about Long Beach, the community, and just who we are and how we fit in into this whole tapestry. Um, thank you, Allison, for the support. And I think this is our sign up for tonight. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We have our, our next grid scheduled for September for Latinx Heritage Month. So be sure to watch out for that upcoming interview and session. And you will be receiving a link to the recording for this uh, event. So stay tuned for that. Again, thank you and have a good evening, everybody.